Well, welcome to the recording for Computer Fundamentals Week 5. As you know, Week 5 is the last week for this course. Week 5 goes from October 7th to October 11th. And the deadline for submitting work is October 11th at midnight. So just a few reminders for you. 595 to pass with a D, 695 is lowest C, 795 is lowest B, and 895 is lowest A. So you want to shoot for the, the B or the A. Get your grades up there. A few reminders, some hints here. If you get crunched for time, like towards the end of the week, please make sure you do all the exams. Do every one. Even if you have to guess on the answers, just getting a few points on an exam will be better than getting zero on an exam, right? In fact, what I would do here in the beginning of the week as you start to wrap things up, I would go ahead and get all the exams finished. Use the previews like I provide for you. Get all the exams finished. Then you know exactly where your grade is and how much more work you need to submit. You will not be able to resubmit any work after Wednesday, October 9th. So even though it goes until October 11th, you can still turn in work. But after I get work on October 9th, the grade you get on that is the grade you get on it. You will not have time to, I will not allow you to resubmit after October 9th. So if you turn in the assignment 3 from the documents unit on October 10th and you only get 10 out of 50 on it, that's what you're stuck with. You cannot redo anything you submit after October 9th. But until October 9th, and through midnight on October 9th, anything you submit, I will get back to you to revise if you need to. Lastly, do not ask for extra credit. Simple thing is, if you do the required work, you'll earn the grade you deserve. So just go in, go to the grade book, see where you have zeros, and get that work made up. Now, the last thing I want to say on here is starting on Sunday of this week, I'm going to put zeros for everything in the course. That way, with zeros on everything for the course, all the way through the end, then every time you turn something in, you'll know exactly what your grade is. That way, there will be no surprises. So all the work for next week is going to have zeros starting on Sunday. Again, the reason I put the zeros in is so there will be no surprises, and you'll know exactly what your grade is as I grade stuff or as you do exams. So don't be afraid if your grade suddenly goes down come Sunday or Monday. It'll go up as you turn in work. All right, this the work for this week. We're in the presentations unit. And it's all about PowerPoint, but of course some of you are using open office presentations and some might be using Prezi. But I would suggest that you use, uh, if you're using something different, use open office rather than an online one like Prezi. Of course, you're going to do these two things, the recording and the write-up. And we have one project you're going to do, a second project you'll do, and they're related just like in previous work. Then finally, the final exam preview and the final exam. So let's jump on down into this unit. So here we are in the presentations unit, all about PowerPoint. So you can see it's going to talk about PowerPoint. And PowerPoint is using both uh, industry and home offices, but schools, uh, kids in school are using it much more. Uh, but there are other options out there like Prezi, Open Office, and things like that. But this is all about PowerPoint. So let's go into the write up first, just like we always do. As we look at this, in section two, explain what, a pers what persuasive technology is. How many points per slide should you have? Give an example of good font use, give an example of bad font use. So let's go into section two. So per persuasive technology describes methods to present or promote a point of view. So all of you have probably heard the word persuasion or like somebody would say, wow, he's a very persuasive speaker, meaning that that person can get other person people on their side or to think about, about their point of view very easily. So that's what persuasive technology is. And PowerPoints are part of persuasive technology because they guide you, they they promote a point or they um, make you start thinking differently about about a topic. And you can see that how when you took, take what computers have with all these a, these information for uh, computers and then the different components of persuasive technology, persuasion, and then how they kind of come together. 
So the objectives in this section look at the fundamental concepts of PowerPoint, basic elements of a PowerPoint presentation. So which of these are persuasive technology? So go ahead and check that, see what you can do with that. Now this is going to talk about PowerPoints and talks about how poorly created presentations with too many colors and graphics can be distract, distracting. And sometimes poor public speakers believe their presentation will have the effect they need, but when the but actually the presenter did a bad job. So we're going to go into this this web page and this talks about do's and don'ts of PowerPoint presentations. So as you look at this, you can see that this is a presentation on how to do presentations. So avoiding the pitfalls of bad slides. And of course, pitfalls means the things that make a slide bad, make it something bad. So some tips be covered. So you can see that this slide presentation starts out with kind of a table of content. And if you look at this, here's you know an outline of a slide. One to two slide outline is what you want to have on a slide. Follow the order of your outline, etc. So that's just some of the basics of PowerPoint. The slide structure. If you're doing a presentation, one to two slides per minute is good. Write in point form like bullets, not sentences. Include four or five points per slide. I think that was an answer to Class Connect write-up question. Four or five points per slide. Use keywords and phrases. Avoid wordiness. So four to five points per slide is the answer to that class connect, one Class Connect write-up question. Check this slide. This is terrible, isn't it? Some of you have turned in work like this. It's confusing. It looks like way too much work. But if we go back to this slide, this slide right here, that whole ugly paragraph, essentially, this is the same information it provides. So isn't it better to do it in nice, concise bullet points? And if you're doing a presentation, so you'll do one slide at a time. So I just hit the, the arrow key, and then it goes through, or one line at a time. So one bit of information. You can see how you can present information pretty, pretty well in a presentation that you're giving. So we're still talking about the slides. So you don't want to use distracting animation. And that's what this one was, because that thing just kind of jumped in there. Good things about fonts. At least 18 point, meaning the size. Use different size fonts from the main points and the secondary points. Use a standard font like Times New Roman or Arial. You don't want to use anything like Comic or, or anything like that. So that's a good thing about fonts. Here's some bad things. Don't use a small font. Capitalize only when necessary, not the whole thing. It's hard to read all caps. And don't use a complicated font. Don't use a bunch of bowling. So there's some bad things about fonts there. This talks about color, like the background should contrast with your text. And of course, the word color, this is, that's the, how color is spelled in um, British English. And that's how this was created. So you can look at a lot of information about color. And there's a lot more slides on here. I mean, look at that lousy use of color. Pretty terrible, isn't it? Very distracting. Information on good backgrounds. You want simple backgrounds. Backgrounds that are light in color. And there's a horrible background and horrible animation, isn't it? Use graphs rather than just charts and words. People can really understand graphs. So here's a bad chart. It really doesn't say anything, does it? It doesn't say what this all means. And here's a good chart. So this was a sales chart. So isn't that much different from this one? So you can see how presentations and presenting information, there's really a science behind it. Here's really a bad graph. Let's see why. Let's look at the good one. Well, actually, that compares that graph to this graph. So look how this one's so simple. And then this one's so complicated. So you don't want minor grid lines. Too, fonts are too small. The colors are illogical. So that's the bad part about that graph. Spelling and grammar, obviously proofread your slides. And you can see they have spelling mistakes they put in here. Bottom out. Um, hopefully they did that on purpose. I imagine they did. And what I do sometimes with a presentation, I'll, you can do the, the spell checker in that. Some people like to take their presentation and copy it into 
a Word document and then do the spell checker there. Finally, you have a strong closing and a good conclusion slide. So this is just about slides in general and, and doing presentations. Back to our class. So here's the whole tutorial. So you'll go through these. It'll show you how to open up PowerPoint and do a little bit of practice. Navigating PowerPoint, just like other uh, Office tools, so you can see the different bars that you have. One thing, PowerPoint is different. It has a notes section that goes at the bottom. And the notes section is where you can create notes that relate to your slide. And then you can use those notes as you, as you, do, as you uh, go over your presentation with people. Slides as pages. So that's the thing to remember, that each slide is a different page. So that's where it's different from Microsoft Word or a Word processing program. So each slide is treated as a different page. And you have to put those pages in, those slide pages in. And of course, saving it. Obviously, by now you should know how to save your work. So in summary, we talk about diff differences in slides and pages, different types of information on slides. Slides are made up of text, graphics, and images. And we learn about what persuasive technology is. So that was section two. So now let's go back to the write-up. So we answered all these questions, didn't we? Good. So section three in PowerPoint, what is the term used for places you type in words? What is the general guideline for use of bullets? What are three format types for bullets? So let's go to section three. So here we are in section three. So this one, you're going to create a new presentation with several slides to, do, to uh, look at basic slide authoring. So it's just going through a quick shot here of opening up a presentation. So you want to watch these um, Watch these presentations, and they'll show you how to do a lot of the work that you, you'll need to do in this class for these presentations. Really, the fundamental concepts of PowerPoint, identify the basic elements of a presentation, create and manipulate presentations. So, you know, a good rule, obviously, is to save immediately. So when you first start to open a document, we start to create it, go ahead and get it saved right off the bat. The title slide, title slide is really important because that introduces what information is going to be. Now the boxes with the dotted lines, those are called text boxes. So text boxes are what you type words in in PowerPoint. And that's different from Microsoft Word where you can use text boxes there, but in general you just type on the page. So text boxes is where you type in words in PowerPoint. Subtitle information, so you can see how this is done. They have their main title and their subtitle. Now, for your project that you're doing, your main title might be will be the name of your project, and then the subtitle would be your own name. So your subtitle should be a little bit smaller text. Formatting a text box, so you can change the characters in a number of ways. You can just change individual characters, or you can do the, the entire text box at once if you want to. So here's a little shot on how to format text boxes. So you can see how the person is clicking on the slide, the text box, and then they can make changes within that text box on everything. Or they can make just changes on individual items within the text box. So they put bolding on the word by a cat. And then they're going to change the color to it. So you can see the different techniques that is being used in this. So that one, they're doing one and changing some color on text. So you all can be a little bit creative in what you do in your presentations. Adding a slide, well, somewhere it, with PowerPoint or OpenOffice, whichever you're using, then um, it'll tell you the slides that you can, where you can insert a new slide. Bullets. Of course, bullets are keys to PowerPoint because bullets be short and to the point, and they give the person the information that you need. So the general guideline for bullets is that they be short and to the point. So you can see this. Flufkin's age 16, clause yes, or they could have typed it in a paragraph. Hi, my cat's name is Flufkin's. Flufkin's is 16 years old, and Flufkin still has his clause. Well, 
it's much easier. I could look at this in one second and learn all this information without having to read a full paragraph. So that's the, the use of bullets. So they can be short and to the point. That's the basic guideline for bullets. Numbered bullets, so there are different, three different ways bullets can be done. Bullets can be done with symbols on them, letters, or numbers. So you can see the types of bullets that are being created here. And remember, the bullets are done automatically. You do not type them in. Look at all the different formats of bullets you can use. So there, the, that person is changing to a kind of a simple bullet. In summary, we looked at text boxes. They contain titles or text, formatted, uh, or individual text within the box can be formatted. Bullets generate or are used for simple and concise statements. Presentations have a, a title slide and then multiple text slides. So let's go back to the write-up. It looks like we answered all three of these questions. Okay, section four. What is a floating toolbar? So let's jump down here to section four. Now, section four is going to talk about the work. And actually, let me go back to section three. There's an assignment in section three. And I've talked about this assignment. I have a recording. If I go right up here and do course home, just like I have for the whole semester, assignment directions, and look right here. Here's a recording on how to do all the presentations work. So I'm not going to cover how to do this project right now. I have that in a separate six-minute video. Okay, so now let's go into drawing diagrams. And okay, drawing diagrams, and I forgot what the Class Connector write-up question was. What is a floating toolbar? So let's remember that. So drawing diagrams. Now drawing diagrams, this is going to be the second project that you have for this unit. And we're going to look at how to use some of the drawing tools. And diagrams are a great way to get your message across. A lot of people like looking at diagrams because they like images better than words. So we're going to identify the basic elements of a presentation, manipulate the PowerPoint presentation, and create diagrams. Here's the drawing toolbar. So you can go across this, you can see the different things that these can do. So I encourage you to, um, you have to put an auto shape into your PowerPoint. You also have to use at least one arrow and you're going to do colors and different fonts and things like that as you do this third project or second project, I should say. And this ribbon, I, I call it the, it's called a toolbar, you call it a tool ribbon, but it's a floating toolbar. It means that it's a separate box that can be moved around. So if I'm working with PowerPoint, I can have this drawing toolbar and I can move it around different places on my screen so it doesn't get in the way of what I'm trying to type. So that's what a floating toolbar is. So go through this and look at how to draw objects. So this is going to show you how to draw a rectangle. So it's in the rectangle mode. You can see that that rectangle, here's a, an oval, and they have fill in the middle of them. So they're filled up with, with color. You can change that color, do all kinds of things. So there's just some demo on, on objects. This one you can see that they have, here's a red fill, here's a blue fill. And on these, you can do different things to them. And this one box is selected because it has these handles around it. Fill versus line. So this is talking about different rectangles. So this is going in and it's going to put a line around the outside of that box. So you can see the different line it's going to put in. And it's going to change the fill color. So it may do the different lines and different fill on this. So that's how you can revamp or restructure some of the objects that you put in. Resizing an object, you click it so it's active, and you have these handles that allow you to grab it and stretch it. And the green one is a rotate where you can make it, you can grab that green button and slide it around and it'll turn the thing into you know, vertical or horizontal. Text and objects. Now you're going to have to put objects into your the second version of your presentation. So you want to make sure you pay attention to how you put in different objects. Different objects would be like arrows, um, uh, clip art, different things like that. So in summary, um, 
You realize if you're typing too many words, maybe a simple picture makes more sense to get your point across. It's essentially the summary for that. Now, project two, just as I mentioned before, go up to the assignment directions announcement, and it talks about doing project two. But project two, you're going to work off of your project one, and you're going to add lots of different components to a fourth slide from project after project one. All right, let's go back to the write-up. So here we are in the write-up. And we answered that question in four. So now section five, using tables, what do you call the boxes in which you could type information? So now we're going to look at using tables and charts in a PowerPoint. Sometimes people don't think you can use tables and charts, but let's look at this. Now here's just information in regular text form, bulleted form. But look at it down below. Which one is easier to read? This one is much easier to read, isn't it? So you can see how tables can be very useful in PowerPoint. We're going to look at basic elements of PowerPoint, manipulate a presentation, create and insert tables. So again, looking at this, you can see how it's very well organized. The scores are easily seen. There are fewer words and the colors and the shapes really help, don't they? Inserting a table. So here's a little tutorial. Go through that. Now, you don't have to do any, any tables or anything. Actually, you don't have any other projects. We just looked over at Project 2 and from Section 4. So there's no more work in here, but it still might be nice to know how to do some of these things. So watch that video. Now, where you type information in tables, those are called cells. So almost just like, a, like Excel has cells, right, or spreadsheets have cells. Well, if we look at this, Here's a table created in PowerPoint, and then each of these cells is a separate text area. So you can do different things for different cells. And I use PowerPoint quite often to create tables because it's much easier than doing them in spreadsheets. Formatting cells. So you can change cells any way you want. You can change the colors of cells. You can change the text that's in cells, the fonts. You can put... Uh, fill color on cells, you can put outline around cells, all kinds of things. Now, if text is too big, of course, you just create, make the, the cells a little bit larger, or you can make the text smaller. Undo button, always useful. So if you do something in PowerPoint that you don't like, just hit your undo button, or you can also hit control Z, and that will undo anything that you've done. So if you look at this, um, you know, if you're if things don't fit very well, so if we go back to this one, you can see that Monday doesn't fit very well. So what can you do to fix that? Well, you can reduce the font size for everything, change the words, rotate the words, all kinds of things. This one they just decided to stretch this out to make the column wider. So we looked at. Uh, how tables can show information in a structured way, help the reader stay focused and organized, highlight specific information you want to talk about. And this doesn't go on to 11. I have no idea what 11, page 11 was supposed to be. I'm going to type 11 here and see if it does go to 11. Oh, there's no project 3. Okay, so something within the editing of this course is incorrect. All right, let's go back to our write-up. We're almost finished, so hang in there. What options do you have if you want to print your presentation to give to your audience? I'm going to go on down here to Section 6 now. In Section 6, now we're going to look at different modes of presenting. So if you have it, have it ready to present the, diff the, the mechanics of pre presenting, what, how can you do that? So we're going to look at different modes of PowerPoint, manipulate PowerPoint presentations, and how to print handouts. So if we look at the different modes, there's the slideshow and there's the view mode. So the view the slide view slideshow, of course, this is a different version of PowerPoint than you have, so yours might have different titles up here. But to view slideshow would be just to look at the slideshow and go use your arrow keys to go uh, back and forth through different slides. So that's the basic view mode right here. And you can use your arrow keys to move to around on different slides. You can even hit the letter B and you'll get a blank screen. And then hit the letter B again, then you'll get another screen. And that's really useful if you're doing a presentation and you want to discuss something with your audience. You can blank your screen so they're not distracted. Speaker notes. We talked about these a little bit before, but speaker notes, you can see down at the bottom here, you would type in notes, so then as you're giving your presentation, 
you can print those notes out and you'd have those available to you. Sometimes like when in online when we're doing some of our classes, I could have my PowerPoint open on my screen with the speaker notes below it, but then all you will see in like the Class Connect screen would just be the regular PowerPoint without my notes. Printing handouts. A lot of times if you're going to give a presentation, you want people to have handouts so they can take notes. And the great thing about handouts is you can print slides per page. You can do one slide, two slides, three, four, four, five, or even six slides per page. So you can see down here, this is the option of six slides per page. So that can be done printed in handout form. So for that Class Connect write-up question, which was, um, what option do you have to print your presentation and give your audience? Well, the option you have is that you can print a certain number of slides per page. That's the option. You can print a certain number of slides per page to provide handouts. You can also print out your notes if you want to have those to read as you're giving your presentation. This talks about the toolbar, so just go through that. It talks about the, um, the slideshow toolbar, just so you get a little more familiar with that. And in summary, we looked at the slideshow mode, printing handouts, and using speaker notes. So review, this is everything we learned about doing PowerPoint, so pretty quick. And a lot of you have this kind of this knowledge anyway, but this is maybe a refresher for you. Then finally, Unit 5 exam, right down here. And as always, I have the exam preview sitting here ready to go for you. So that's all I have for you. So for this week, again, you have, this is the last week. Make sure you pay attention to these notes up here. You have the write-up to do. You have project one to do, project two to do, and finally the exam. So this week, I would say with project one and project two, those might take you an hour at the most. The write-up might take you a half an hour, and then the exam, it might take you a half an hour to find the answers and then do the exam. So this week is two to three hours. Not a big deal, is it? All right. Well, I look forward to your work coming in, and remember, the deadline is... Friday, October 11th at 11.59 p.m. at night. But anything turned in after 11.59 on Wednesday, you'll not be able to revise. So try to get all your work in by Wednesday at 11.59. Then you'll have a chance to revise if needed. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye.